Patriarchs and Prophets, Chapter 16, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau, the twin sons of Isaac, present a striking contrast, both in character and in life. This unlikeness was foretold by the angel of God before their birth. When, in answer to Rebekah's troubled prayer, he declared that two sons would be given her, he opened to her their future history, that each would become the head of a mighty nation, but that one would be greater than the other, and that the younger would have the preeminence. Esau grew up loving self-gratification and centering all his interest in the present. Impatient of restraint, he delighted in the wild freedom of the chase and early chose the life of a hunter. Yet he was the father's favorite. The quiet, peace-loving shepherd was attracted by the daring and vigor of his elder son, who fearlessly ranged over mountain and desert, returning home with game for his father and with exciting accounts of his adventurous life. Jacob, thoughtful, diligent and caretaking, ever thinking more of the future than the present, was content to dwell at home, occupied in the care of the flocks and the tillage of the soil. His patient perseverance, thrift and foresight were valued by the mother. His affections were deep and strong and his gentle, unremitting attentions aided far more to her happiness than did the boisterous and occasional kindnesses of Esau. To Rebekah, Jacob was the dearer son. The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Jacob as the great object of their desires and hopes. With these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar. They were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance for it included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family and in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. On the other hand, there were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright. He who should inherit its blessings must devote his life to the service of God. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements in marriage, in his family relations, in public life. He must consult the will of God. Isaac made known to his sons these privileges and conditions and plainly stated that Esau, as the eldest, was the one entitled to the birthright. But Esau had no love for devotion, no inclination to a religious life. The requirements that accompanied the spiritual birthright were an unwelcome and even hateful restraint to him. The law of God, which was the condition of the divine covenant with Abraham, was regarded by Esau as a yoke of bondage. Bent on self-indulgence, he desired nothing so much as liberty to do as he pleased. To him, power and riches, feasting and reveling were happiness. He gloried in the unrestrained freedom of his wild, roving life. Rebecca remembered the words of the angel, and she read with clearer insight than did her husband the character of their sons. She was convinced that the heritage of divine promise was intended for Jacob. She repeated to Isaac the angel's words, but the father's affections were centered upon the elder son, and he was unshaken in his purpose. Jacob had learned from his mother of the divine intimation that the birthright should fall to him, and he was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privileges which it would confer. It was not the possession of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing to commune with God as did righteous Abraham, to offer the sacrifice of atonement for his family, 
to be the progenitor of the chosen people and the promised Messiah and to inherit the immortal possessions embraced in the blessings of the covenant. Here were the privileges and honors that kindled his most ardent desires. His mind was ever reaching forward to the future and seeking to grasp its unseen blessings. With secret longing, he listened to all that his father told concerning the spiritual birthright. He carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Day and night, the subject occupied his thoughts until it became the absorbing interest of his life. But while he thus esteemed eternal above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. He believed that the promise concerning himself could not be fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn. And he constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing which his brother held so lightly, but which was so precious to himself. When Esau, coming home one day faint and weary from the chase, asked for the food that Jacob was preparing, the latter, with whom one thought was ever uppermost, seized upon his advantage and offered to satisfy his brother's hunger at the price of the birthright. And behold, I am at the point to die, cried the reckless, self-indulgent hunter. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And for a dish of red pottage, he parted with his birthright and confirmed the transaction by an oath. A short time at most would have secured him food in his father's tents, but to satisfy the desire of the moment, he carelessly bartered the glorious heritage that God himself had promised to his fathers. His whole interest was in the present. He was ready to sacrifice the heavenly to the earthly to exchange a future good for a momentary indulgence. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In disposing of it, he felt a sense of relief. Now his way was unobstructed. He could do as he liked. For this wild pleasure, miscalled freedom, how many are still selling their birthright to an inheritance pure and undefiled, eternal in the heavens? Ever subject to mere outward and earthly attractions, Esau took two wives of the daughters of Heth. They were worshippers of false gods, and their idolatry was a bitter grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Esau had violated one of the conditions of the covenant which forbade intermarriage between the chosen people and the heathen. Yet Isaac was still unshaken in his determination to bestow upon him the birthright. The reasoning of Rebekah, Jacob's strong desire for the blessing, and Esau's indifference to its obligations had no effect to change the father's purpose. Years passed on, until Isaac, old and blind, and expecting soon to die, determined no longer to delay the bestowal of the blessings upon his elder son. But knowing the opposition of Rebekah and Jacob, he decided to perform the solemn ceremony in secret. In accordance with the custom of making a feast upon such occasions, the patriarch bade Esau, Go out to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Rebecca divined his purpose. She was confident that it was contrary to what God had revealed as his will. Isaac was in danger of incurring the divine displeasure and of debarring his younger son from the position to which God had called him. She had in vain tried the effect of reasoning with Isaac, and she determined to resort 
to stratagem. No sooner had Esau departed on his errand than Rebecca set about the accomplishment of her purpose. She told Jacob what had taken place, urging the necessity of immediate action to prevent the bestowal of the blessing, finally and irrevocably upon Esau. And she assured her son that if he would follow her directions, he might obtain it as God had promised. Jacob did not readily consent to the plan that she proposed. The thought of deceiving his father caused him great distress. He felt that such a sin would bring a curse rather than a blessing. But his scruples were overborne and he proceeded to carry out his mother's suggestions. It was not his intention to utter a direct falsehood. But once in the presence of his father, he seemed to have gone too far to retreat, and he obtained by fraud the coveted blessing. Jacob and Rebekah succeeded in their purpose, but they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. God had declared that Jacob should receive the birthright, and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited in faith for him to work for them. But like many who now profess to be children of God, they were unwilling to leave the matter in his hands. Rebecca bitterly repented the wrong counsel she had given her son. It was the means of separating him from her, and she never saw his face again. From the hour when he received the birthright, Jacob was weighed down with self-condemnation. He had sinned against his father, his brother, his own soul, and against God. In one short hour, he had made work for a lifelong repentance. This scene was vivid before him in after years, when the wicked course of his own sons oppressed his soul. No sooner had Jacob left his father's tent than Esau entered. Though he had sold his birthright and confirmed the transfer by a solemn oath, he was now determined to secure its blessings, regardless of his brother's claim. With the spiritual was connected the temporal birthright, which would give him the headship of the family and possession of a double portion of his father's wealth. These were the blessings that he could value. Let my father arise, he said, and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. Trembling with astonishment and distress, the blind old father learned the deception that had been practiced upon him. His long and fondly cherished hopes had been thwarted, and he keenly felt the disappointment that must come upon his eldest son. Yet the conviction flashed upon him that it was God's providence which had defeated his purpose and brought about the very thing he had determined to prevent. He remembered the words of the angel to Rebekah, and notwithstanding the sin of which Jacob was now guilty, he saw in him the one best fitted to accomplish the purposes of God. While the words of blessing were upon his lips, he had felt the spirit of inspiration upon him. And now, knowing all the circumstances, he ratified the benediction unwittingly pronounced upon Jacob. I have blessed him, yea, and he shall be blessed. Esau had lightly valued the blessing while it seemed within his reach but he desired to possess it now that it was gone from him forever. All the strength of his impulsive, passionate nature was aroused and his grief and rage were terrible. He cried with an exceeding bitter cry, Bless me, even me also, my father. Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? But the promise given was not to be recalled. The birthright, which he had carelessly bartered, he could not now regain. For one morsel of meat, 
for a momentary gratification of appetite that had never been restrained. Esau sold his inheritance, but when he saw his folly, it was too late to recover the blessing. He found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau was not shut out from the privilege of seeking God's favor by repentance, but he could find no means of recovering the birthright. His grief did not spring from conviction of sin. He did not desire to be reconciled to God. He sorrowed because of the results of his sin, but not for the sin itself. Because of his indifference to the divine blessing and requirements, Esau is called, in Scripture, a profane person. He represents those who lightly value the redemption purchased for them by Christ and are ready to sacrifice their airship to heaven for the perishable things of earth. Multitudes live for the present with no thought or care for the future. Like Esau, they cry, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. They are controlled by inclination, and rather than practice self-denial, they will forego the most valuable considerations. If one must be relinquished, the gratification of a depraved appetite, or the heavenly blessings promised only to the self-denying and God-fearing, the claims of appetite prevail, and God and heaven are virtually despised. How many, even of professed Christians, cling to indulgences that are injurious to health and that benumb the sensibilities of the soul? When the duty is presented of cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, they are offended. They see that they cannot retain these hurtful gratifications and yet secure heaven. And they conclude that since the way to eternal life is so straight, they will no longer walk therein. Multitudes are selling their birthright for sensual indulgence. Health is sacrificed. The mental faculties are enfeebled and heaven is forfeited and all for a mere temporary pleasure, an indulgence at once both weakening and debasing in its character. As Esau awoke to see the folly of his rash exchange when it was too late to recover his loss, so it will be in the day of God with those who have bartered their airship to heaven for selfish gratifications.